the upside down kingdom. When you take your Bibles and you move from the very last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, and you turn to the very first book of the New Testament, where we are today, called Matthew, did you know that you advanced 400 years in time? Did you know that 400 years, which is typically known by theologians as the intertestamental period, and all that is is a fancy saying of the time between the Old Testament and the New. It's called the 400 silent years. And because of this time, these 400 years between the last prophet of the Old Testament, Malachi, and the beginning of the New Testament, Matthew, these 400 years are the times in which God said nothing. He didn't speak through any prophets. There was no new revelation for over 400 years. God was silent. And the question we should ask is, why was God silent? And so I want you to think about it this way. If you have a major announcement to make, let's say maybe you have a gender reveal for a baby, or you're getting a new promotion, or you're getting ready to graduate, and you invite people over to gather, and they're there to celebrate, and they're excited, everyone's in the room, they're having conversations, people are laughing, and they're talking, right? And when you're ready to make the announcement, what's the first thing that you do? Hey, y'all, hey, hey, calm that down. Shh, I got something I want to share with you. And you, you do that because you want them to be able to hear the special announcement. And right see, that's pretty much what God is doing now. He's saying, shh, keep it down. I want to make sure the room, better yet, the whole entire world is quiet because I have a super important announcement to make. The Messiah, the Christ. Jesus is here. And so the Gospel of Matthew is a testimony about Jesus. It's all about the King and His coming kingdom. And if you remember just a few months ago, we in December we went through this sermon series in December called The Season of Grace, and we examined the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 1. We talked about the genealogy of Jesus and how Jesus invites us to be a part of His family tree, right? And so typically in the Christmas season, Matthew chapter 1 and chapter 2 are very Christmas-themed um, passages of Scripture that we typically go to. But this morning, we're going to jump into this series, and we're going to jump into Matthew 3 over the next few months. And so I just want to give you some background on Matthew and his Gospels. I want to give you some cliff notes, pun intended, all right? And so we really don't know a lot about Matthew. That's the deal. We don't know a lot about him, but here's what... We do know. Matthew's name in the Hebrew is Matthew Yahweh. Say that one time. It means gift of Yahweh. In many cultures, names have meaning and significance, right? Some of us, maybe not so much, right? But Matthew does, right? It means gift of God. So if your name is Matthew, if you know a Matt, that person has a really good name. And Matthew was one of Jesus' 12 original disciples. He was chosen by Jesus. He was one of the OGs in what we read about in Matthew Gospel. In Matthew chapter 9, Matthew pins down and he writes and records his own conversion story and how he comes to meet our living Lord. But interestingly enough, the thing I want to call out for us is that Matthew leaves out some things in his Gospel that he writes. And how do we know that? Well, when you read Luke's Gospel, Luke tells us that Matthew actually throws a big party, a huge feast for Jesus shortly after he's converted. Luke said that Matthew invited Jesus into his house, and then he gave up everything to follow his Lord. And what I find really interesting and also very commendable is that Matthew doesn't put that down in his gospel. He doesn't say, you know what, <laughs> you know, I met Jesus, I invited him to my crib, we had a big party for him, you know what I'm saying? And then afterwards, you know, on my way to follow him, he did everything he wanted me to do. He doesn't tell us that about himself. Luke has to do so. But what Matthew does take time to tell us is that he was a tax collector. Now, isn't that strange, church? He doesn't talk about the big party that he did for Jesus and how he followed him obediently. But he tells us more about that he was a tax collector. And I'm just thinking about it now that I was reading the scriptures this week. I'm like, man, if I was telling my story to God, 
I'd probably tell him about the party piece and follow him after the party, but I probably will leave the tax collector piece out. Right? Why? Well, for one, we know this biblically that tax collectors were viewed horribly back then, especially being that Matthew was a Jew. Matthew was a Jew working for the Roman government. What that means is that he was taking money from his own people. Yet, considering all, all of this, he was willing to say, I'm not going to tell you that I gave a great feast for Jesus and I gave up everything to follow him, but I will tell you that I was an IRS agent. Church, I take all that time to share this morning because little nuggets like this increase my faith and show me the humility of the writer that they wrote the Holy Spirit gives. It also gives me great hope. And it should give you great hope this morning. Because if God can save a crooked tax and IRS agent, <laughs> He can save people like you and me. Amen. Amen. And so now about the book, that's about Matthew. About the book itself, it's written sometime in the early 50 AD's. And as Matthew is writing, he's writing for all people, but he's primarily writing to his very own, to Jewish brothers and sisters. Right? He's writing to them, and he wants to convince to them that Jesus truly is the Messiah. And because of that, what we find that is in the Gospel of Matthew, we find more Old Testament references and quotations than any other book in the Bible. Over a hundred Old Testament quotations. And he's doing this because he wants the Jews to know and understand that their own Jewish scriptures actually talk about and prophesy about the coming Messiah who is no other than Jesus. Amen. Lastly, Matthew also talks a lot about the kingdom, which if you've been with us the past few weeks, we've done a whole sermon series talking about the kingdom of God. Matthew uses the word kingdom over 54, well, not over, 54 times in his gospel. And then there's this phrase, called the kingdom of heaven. And that's used 34 times in the entire Bible, but 32 of those 34 times is used in Matthew's gospel. So I think the kingdom's pretty important, and that's why we got the title of the Upside Down Kingdom. So that's the background with some cliff notes, if you will. Now let's go ahead and dive in and, and, and divide and dive in on God's word, all right? Let's go ahead and pray for our times this morning. Would you Bow your heads and reverence to God and close our eyes as we fix our eyes on the Lord. Father, can we come here this morning wanting to hear and be transformed by you. We know that faith comes through hearing and hearing comes the word of God. And so we ask this morning, like many saints of old have asked throughout the years, Lord, we know not Teach us what we have not give us and what we are not make us. Father, we ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. God, God, people said, Amen. 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 This morning, I have a question for you. How many of you this morning have ever heard a fire and brimstone preaching? Amen. They have to be kind of reluctant, right? Maybe you know someone who's been a part of a church or that really values that preaching tradition. And as I thought, and we this as I thought about that myself, I remember being a college student at UCF, and I remember every Tuesday and Thursday, I'd be walking to calculus class, I'd have to pass through the union, and there would be this street preacher. And he'd have his microphone, and he'd have a big old sign saying, repent or perish. And then at the top of his lungs, he would be screaming, and he would just be giving people the business, y'all. Quoting scripture and screaming at the top of his lungs that if you don't stop filling the blank, you are going to hell. If you don't stop fornicating, you're going to get the fire. If you don't stop listening to R&B and hip-hop, Jesus is going to send your way down to Satan. That's what he would be saying. How many of you all know of folks like that. I don't know what you're talking about. Maybe you've been in a church and you've experienced this before. Some of you may be saying to yourself, Pastor Cliff, I actually love preaching like that. Well, I just want to tell you this morning, right? It's okay to be in a minority. 
But for a lot of people, that tradition can be very off-putting. It can be a turn-off. And what really troubles me about that camp church is that after like really looking at them and studying them sometimes, it can really appear to be that they love seeing people experience pain more than anything. It's not about the gospel. And truth be told, if that's the constant diet, diet that you're receiving from God's word, if that's all you hear and preach and listen to 24-7, then most likely and there's not going to be much love, grace, and kindness in your life. Amen. But here's the thing I want us to understand this morning. While those preachers' tones oftentimes are horrible and, and, and aren't really palatable for most people, here's the truth. If you study the scriptures, and if you take a close look at Matthew chapter 3 with me this morning, in particular, it turns out that these guys are actually half right. It turns out that they are all the way wrong. Here's the gospel truth, Reading City, that I want us to receive this morning. Our sins, sin being any thought, act, or, or word that are contrary to God and His nature, they separate us from God. They keep us from a relationship with Him and a relationship to being able to enter the kingdom of heaven. Hell, hell, hell is a real awful and fiery place of punishment for people who do not return and repent from their sins and trust in Jesus. But, but, but here is where our fire and brimstone folks miss the mark. You see, ultimately, fear of punishment could never be the primary motivator when it comes to getting back on track with God. Amen. Now, just for clarity, it is a motivator, right? How many of you are going to go to hell, right? You know what I mean? Nobody's going to raise their hand in their right mind. We are motivated by that. But however, our main motivator, our main motivation for entering into the kingdom of God should be entering into a brand new, loving, life-giving, transformational life in a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus. Amen? Amen. And that's exactly what He offers us in the gospel. we got to have balance. So here's the big idea. The main thing we learned from Matthew chapter 3 is this. Write this down. To enter into the kingdom of heaven, you must turn from your sins and trust in Jesus. To enter into the kingdom of heaven, you must turn from your sins and trust in Jesus. <clears throat> you know, church, this, this passage is is incredibly helpful because Matthew gives us the balance we need to have a proper understanding of what true biblical repentance is. You see, repentance is turning away from something that is sin, but it's also turning to someone. His name is Jesus. And so as we kick off this series, I think this message is really appropriate for two reasons. When you think about balancing, there's typically two people on both sides of the scale. Person number one, right, many of us need to act. The reason why this series is so important for us is that many of us here today need to act with so much greater of a sense of urgency when it comes to dealing with the sin that's in our lives. You either are intentionally abusing the grace of God because you believe that he's the type of God that doesn't care about sin, is just going to let you float on in the heaven because you think you're a good person. But that isn't right, is it? That's not biblical. The scriptures say that all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Our sins separate us from God. And since God is a just God, he has to punish sin. And as a result, we as believers, we praise God, though, because he made a provision of his sin, of our sin, rather, through the person and work of Jesus Christ. But listen, the thing we need to understand is that that provision isn't just automatically given and applied to everyone. You, if you're sitting here this morning, you have to personally make a decision to turn from your sins and trust in Jesus to receive salvation. There's good news, but the good news is really good news when we understand the bad news. Secondly, on the flip side of things, 
Some of you here this morning are saved, but you take sin so seriously that it's caused you to have a distorted view of God. Some of us here have taken sin so seriously that it's caused us to have a distorted view of God. You're, 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 you feel moved and heavy all the time. You don't see things clearly. You're, you're troubled. And in your mind, God the Father is in heaven with a hammer just looking to crush you. And, and, and what I want to tell you this morning is that if you truly trust in Jesus, you need to be reminded that he's already been crushed for your behalf. He's not looking to crush you. He's already been crushed for you. He took away the punishment that you deserve, and now as a result, his righteousness has been credited to you, and your sin has been nailed on the cross to him. But that's the good news of the gospel. And yes, God said, well, okay, that's in the future, but yes, God still disciplines us now in the here and now, but listen, when he disciplines us, it's always to correct us, not to condemn us. Amen. If you haven't memorized Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it's a great scripture to memorize. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. So my prayer for you this morning, church, is that God would give us a fresh vision of what it means to enter the kingdom of God, a fresh vision of what it means to have both faith and repentance. And so let's dive in and get to work. We've got a lot of Bible to cover this morning, and I want to make sure we do it in a timely manner. The first thing I want you to come right down, it comes from verses 1 through 6, is this. Number one, you have to repent to enter the kingdom of God. You have to repent in order to enter the kingdom of God. Now remember, God has been silent for 400 years. No prophet has spoken in 400 years, and then we have this individual named John the Baptizer. He pulls up on the scene, and he verifies that he's a true prophet, because the scriptures say that he actually has fulfilled Isaiah verse 43, and that prophecy is this. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And so John serves as a forerunner. John serves as a forerunner for the Messiah. His role is to prepare the people for the King, and that's King Jesus. And he prepares the way by preaching, by proclaiming this news. Now think about it. What's your posture going to be like if you haven't heard divine revelation, new revelation, for after 400 years? You're going to lean in, right? You're listening to every word. You want to hear and receive what's going on. And so hear the word that John steps on the scene with in verse 2. He says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. Question for you this morning. I'm going to do this morning. Question I have for you. How many of you are excited when you hear the word repentance? How about you? I see head shaking. Nah. Nah, right? How many of you are excited when you hear the word repentance? What if I told you you shouldn't be? What if I told you this morning, according to the Bible, which we all believe, if we're here, or at least we're trying to investigate the scripture to find out. What if I told you that repentance should be a good thing that we hear in a good way? Let me bring some clarity here. But the word, the Greek word for repent means to intellectually have a change of mind. It means to have a change of thinking. That's why I was so thankful for Pastor Will when he preached at the end of the year about this new mindset that we should have in regards to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. You remember that? Therefore, in view of God's mercy, I urge you to offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is a spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but instead, by the renewing of your mind, be transformed by God's word. Right? The Bible talks about repentance as an intellectual change of mind. That's what the Greek word means, but there's even a more fuller understanding of repentance. The Bible basically teaches that it entails, it entails a, a total life change as well. In the Old Testament, it, it meant a radical return to God by the people of God who broke in covenant with him, and so it is with us, right in the city. For us, all of us who follow Jesus, we're called to be a people of repentance. We're called to live a life of repentance, and it's God who ultimately initiates 
repentance in us. I want you to write down these four components of repentance. Here's what repentance looks like, right? Number one, it starts with a conviction about it, meaning that we actually agree and affirm with it being wrong in opposition to God, and we're like, man, I actually have a conviction, I have remorse, and I have the right belief about it. Number two, it comes with an acknowledgement of the sin. I, I don't just say, yeah, I'm sorry, God. Sorry about what? There's an acknowledgement about the specific sin. When my kids make mistakes, and they say, I'm sorry, man, I messed up. What are, you, what are you sorry about? I want them to know what they're specifically sorry about because it's important to acknowledge our sin if we want to see real change in our life. Number three, then there's a confession of sin. We have to, we have, to have a conviction about it. We, there's a remorse. There's an acknowledgement. Then there's a confession of our sin. Confession isn't repentance. It's part of repentance. And what that leads to is a sorrow for sin that leads to conversion. Once we've had the conviction, we've acknowledged, we've confessed, that leads to a space where we can actually say, man, I'm sorrowful, like this is going to change, I'm walking away, I'm never going back again. I'm following Jesus. Church, we talk a lot about faith and belief, right? Like I say, hey, Anita, you're such a woman of faith. Or Vicky, you just believe so well. Or Caitlin, you are just amazing, you're just an amazing woman of faith. Pastor Will, I just wish I had faith and I believe like you hear, like if I ask the question, how many of us want to be people of faith and believe? All oh, y'all gonna be like, yeah, yeah, that's good right there, right? But all jokes aside, right? Do you know that repentance and faith, repentance and belief, are actually two different sides of the same coin? When you think about it that way, that sounds good, doesn't it? You see, repentance is turning away from my sin. But faith, on the other side, is turning to Jesus. They're two sides of the same coin. They're both good. We don't like the word repentance because it deals with sin. Right? Because we're turning away from what's bad and turning good. But even too, when we turn to Jesus, what were we going the other way? It's that we're, st- we're still in the same boat. Repentance happens when you come to turn with your sins, when you're broken over your sins, when you realize they've separated you from a loving God, your heavenly creator, and then you turn and you say, you make a decisive decision, and you turn to God, and you say, man, I throw myself at your feet. You are worthy. You are holy, holy, holy. As we sing, and, 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 and then when you do that, God gives you a new heart. He changes your motivations. And again, like, the hell piece is going to be a motivator, but what motivates us when we hear the scandalous grace that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, and that's what compels us. The scripture said that Christ's love compels us. It changes us. The scandalous good news and the grace of the gospel. So I can't tell you how many times as a young man that I made all these casual battles and said, I'm going to change, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm struggling with porn, I'm struggling with this, I'm struggling with um, how I do this, and I'm struggling, and I'm confessing it. But listen, I never saw true and lasting change in my life until I repented before the Lord. And we should feel an urgency to repent because verse 2 says, yo, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is coming back. This isn't a fairy tale. This isn't the Wizard of Oz. This isn't Lord of the Rings. Right? This isn't Pokemon. This isn't a reality TV. This is real reality. Jesus is coming back and he's here. He's at hand. And John is announcing that the rule and reign of God is breaking through in a new way through this person named Jesus. And church, it can be both encouraging and concerning. Encouraging because we know that through Jesus we get to enter the kingdom of heaven. We get to taste and see that God is good and to live that John 10 abundant and full life. And we get to spend eternity with him if we trust in him. But if we don't repent, if we don't come to the end of ourselves and, and take God mercy, we'll be left out of the kingdom forever and we'll face the eternal judgment forever. And listen, if you're here and you said, man, that sounds kind of old school, like, I, I, I'm, I want the church that only talking about grace. And if you're here and you're saying, man, that sounds harsh. It is harsh. 
is the bad news in the gospel. But the good news is that if we turn and we realize our sin and we accept it and we turn to Jesus and accept Him, we have eternal life. As we keep reading, we get to learn about this peculiar prophet named John. And we see the people's response to John's message. And really, the people's response to John's message should really be a model for how we were to respond. Listen to the word that John has to say, starting in verse 4. Now, John had a camel hair garment with a leather belt. Try to visualize this, right? Don't visit me with this all the time. visit John. John had a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then people from Jerusalem, all of Judea and the vicinity of the Jordan, were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So what does this tell us, right? What does this tell us? As we're reading this, what does this tell us? Number one, it should tell us that John's a little bit weird, isn't that? He's a little weird, right? It's strange. It tells us that he's a simple man. He's your average Joe, not your average John, right? He wore wilderness clothing, he had a diet, a poor man's diet, and he didn't have the good stuff, you know? No pokaina in there somebody. No kumbi in this room. No mac and cheese and greens and this fried chicken. He ain't got none of that good stuff, right? What Matthew's trying to show us here is that there's nothing compelling about John. There's no nothing compelling about his appearance. In fact, his appearance might have been off-putting and unattractive. He wasn't bougie, right? He didn't have it all put together, but in spite of all that, in spite of his appearance, in spite of how he looked, there is thousands of people flocking to hear his message. They're hearing to hear this man's message of repentance, and why should that matter to us, Radio City? It shouldn't matter because what does this prove? It proves that there isn't power in a man, but there's power in the message of this man. Right? And for the record, this is why we strive for simplicity in our church. Yes, we want to be uh, excellent, but we want to be simple. We don't wear big suits and ties. Nothing wrong with that, but we don't wear big suits and ties. We just wear average clothing. Walmart leave to somebody. Right? We don't have a lot of production. We don't want to market a lot of stuff because oftentimes the stuff hinders us from being able to see the Savior. And we want to be all about Jesus and not about us. When it comes to Christianity, church, what you get people with, you keep people with. We want to get people with the gospel. And the gospel is going to be offensive and nothing else should be. That should be the only offensive thing. I don't want to get you with all the assorted items we have when we come in here. I don't want to get you just because we have a good kid ministry and you can drop your kids off there. I don't want to get you because, I don't know, fill in the blank. We want to get you with Jesus. And so when you see um, the love of our people, and they say it's because of Jesus, and they just say, I want to know who Jesus is. We want to be the aroma of Christ. The people of God are the aroma of Christ. We're with cells in and if you just turn on the side, that's great. You miss the way. But what you want to get people with is Jesus. And here's what's crazy. Notice what's happening as the people come. So notice how they respond to the message. They're being baptized in the Jordan River, which, by the way, I've been to Israel. I've seen the Jordan River. It doesn't look, the water's really dirty, right? They're coming to John, getting baptized in the Jordan River, and what does the scriptures tell us they're doing? They're confessing their sins. They're confessing their sins. And what I want to tell you this morning, so should we be You see, the one we like to confess, right? We like to confess our righteousness, and we like to hide our sin. But that is unbiblical. The Bible tells us that we should confess our sins. And when it comes to practicing our righteousness, we should not in our left hand know what our right hand is doing. And so I want to ask you this one. There's two questions I want to ask you to seriously consider in your heart. Number one is have you truly repented? The kingdom of God is at hand. Have you truly repented in your own heart? Have you come to an agreement with God about your sins? 
Do you feel bad? Are you broken about your sins? Or have you made a decisive decision to follow Jesus? Understand that that is the only way you enter heaven. Period. Number two, if you are a believer, the question I want to ask you this morning is, when is the last time you confess your sins to a brother or sister in Christ? There's so many of us here this morning who confess their sins to God, but do not confess our sins to others. Like, well, God's good. God's good. God's good. God's good. Absolutely. But James chapter 5 says, confess your sins to one another so that you might be healed. Some of you might be dealing with struggles in your sin and you're in bondage with your sin because you're sinning in private and in public, but you're not going to others and letting people into your lives so that you know what's going on. But they can pray for you. The scripture says that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So confess your sins to one another. Is that a regular habit of yours? Are you a person that's known for confessing your sin? Church, the type of church we need to be if we're going to be a gospel-centered church, if we're going to push back back to the blood of Jesus, we need to be a people who are open and vulnerable and willing, knowing who to confess now. I'm confessing everybody. You got some people who talk a little bit, all right? Now, <laughs> right? But have a good relationship. Use wisdom. Don't just say, hey, everybody, I don't care when you confess in. Hey, you, hear it out there. Don't say that. We're not saying that. But use wisdom. Build a relationship in your city group, in your DNA group. Find somebody. Ask me, Pastor Will, Pastor Rossi, who's somebody that I have to go to? Come to us. If you're a woman, it's something that's not. Maybe the right thing to share with a man comes up and says, hey, there's something I need to talk about. Do you, have, do you know a spiritual mature woman I can talk to? And we can point you in that direction. And we can pray for you unknowingly what was going on when we got here in this evening that. But we need to be a people of confession. A people of confession. A people of confession. John the Baptist makes it clear and straight. He doesn't wait any time. It's been 400 plus years now. And he goes straight to the mustard. And he says, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must repent. Then what he does after that, in verses 7 through 12, he, he gives us these warnings. He says, number two, we have to be aware of false kingdom entry points. Remember in our kingdom series, every kingdom, right, has a gospel of sorts. Every kingdom has some sort of good news that they're telling you to believe and to grab and be enticed from, but they're false gospels, they're false truths, they're false kingdoms, and so there's these two groups that come to ruin the party. People are confessing their sins, they're getting saved, and then you got these cats called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They pull them up. And the Pharisees, they're the teacher of the law. They're the they're from the party of the common people, right? The poor people. And they're supposed to be new the law, they knew the Bible of, of that time. And you have the Sadducees. The Sadducees are from another part. They're from a party that represents the rich people in the day, right? And typically these two people don't get along. But they're like, man, you can't beat them, join them. So we're going to come ahead and we're going to put this guy Jesus to a stop. And when John the Baptist is out there baptizing the folks, he sees them coming, and he doesn't waste any time. What does he say to them? Verse 7 and 8. When he, that's John, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he says to them, brutal vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, therefore produce consistent with Repentance. John calls them a brood of vipers. You don't have to be a scholar to know that's not a good thing to say. No. <laughs> that's not a good thing to say. It's a very impressive statement. And he calls them vipers because they're spreading poisonous venom. That's what he calls them a viper. And the venom they're spreading is what? It's false teaching. John has righteous anger and indignation because these people are leading people astray from what God would have for them. That's why it's our job as pastors, Pastor Will, Pastor Nassi, and myself, it's our job to protect you from people that are sharing false news. And so we want to talk about some of those false news today. Here's the first false kingdom entry point. Don't take this one. Google's not telling you the right way to go. We look at the Bible. That's your ultimate navigation piece, right? He says false kingdom entry point number one is that we can be saved by association. We can be saved by association. This is what John says to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He says, and don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham 
out of these stones. And so what's happening here is that these people, the Pharisees and Sadducees, are assuming that they can go to heaven simply because they're part of God's ethnic group. They're part of God's ethnic people. They got this free pass. They believe that they're 100% spiritually healthy because they have Father Abraham to go to. Many Jews believe that they were in right standing spiritually because of their spiritual heritage of his faith, Abraham. So I want you to write this down. Being a child of God is not a matter of heritage, but a matter of heart. Being a child of God is not a matter of heritage, but a matter of heart. True children of Abraham experience freedom from sin through their faith in Jesus. Being born into a Christian family is an amazing thing with amazing privileges. You have this solid foundation that you come into. Some would even say it makes it easier for some people, but the Bible makes it clear in so many places, church, that salvation doesn't come through natural and physical birth. It comes through a supernatural birth. To be born again. You have to be born again. When we, and that occurs when we place our faith in Jesus. And the reason why I want to share this to us this morning is because I've talked to, to some people, many people, that, hey, you're, you're a Christian, absolutely. I don't, I've, been going, I've been going to church all my life. I've been a Christian all my life. Well, I, 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 I know that. I went to Sunday school. I heard it. Yeah, the gospel. John 3.16. Cool stuff, right? Never been a true repentance, turning from your sins to Jesus. And your spiritual heritage, your Sunday school teacher, your parents, none of that, none of that saves you. It's a good foundation because prayerfully they proclaim the good news to you. But you still have to personally turn from your sins and turn to Jesus. And he tells them that you should see fruit in your life. Galatians 5, type fruit. Fruit like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness gentleness and self-control. We aren't saved by association. Number two, we aren't saved by personal righteousness. That's the other entry point. The Pharisees were some of the most rule-keeping people around the church. They thought they could store up their own personal righteousness and that somehow by their own efforts they could gain favor in God's eyes. But the Bible teaches us that our sins separate us from God. No matter how hard we work, no matter how hard we try, we claw our way through. We can never ruin the stain of sin by our own power. We can never cancel our sin in and of ourselves. But in verse 11, John looks ahead to the greater one to come. John looks ahead to Jesus Christ showing us precisely, precisely what Jesus would offer. He said in verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance. Listen to this church. But the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I. I'm not worthy to remove his sins. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. If you've got a Pentecostal background, the baptism of the Holy Spirit takes place at conversion. The moment we place faith in Jesus, God comes to live and us through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus saves us from the power of sin, excuse me, from the penalty of sin, the moment we believe in him, but he also saves us from the power of sin, that the Holy Spirit indwells us and gives us the power to say yes to God and in order for righteousness. And as hard as this may be for many of us, if you're a hard-working person, if you're an athlete, maybe you have a blue-collar nature, you've just been taught to work hard and see results, this is a hard teaching. But this is the upside-down kingdom. Salvation in church comes not by working harder to get to God. But salvation comes by giving up and surrendering to God. Totally opposite of what you may be hearing. Everywhere else you go, the Bible teaches, no, 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 no. You can't earn or merit or lighten up your way to God. You have to give up and completely surrender to God. Amen. Here's the last false point. YOLO. YOLO. Y-O-L-O. It's the belief that you only live once. <laughs> right? As religious as they were, the Sadducees didn't believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in a coming kingdom. So what did they try to do? What's the response for many of them? Someone's like, ah, oh, forget that all oh, forget that all the religious stuff. I want, I got my heaven now. 
like heaven now, really, there's no resurrection. So let's just live our best life now. And what does this sound like? Isn't that what we see in South Florida? The beautiful people come down here because it's beautiful. People that are older in, in, in the north, 61% of Palm Beach County is from New York and Jersey. And they come down after they retire a lot. The kingdom. I'm here. This is it. Pina Coladas, beach, big house. Whatever we do, whatever we can do, right? The scratch car and climb the ladder to accept our cost. That's what we see here. Salvation for most Americans is seen as bigger and better, baby. Three beats. Bigger and better, baby. Bigger and better house. Bigger and better vacation. Exclusive social settings. Bigger and better retirement. Living our best life. That's what we want our legacy to be. But as Americans who tend to be consumed with ambition for this life, God calls us to switch that mentality, to have that mind shift. Right? And we need to fix our eyes and do a better job on fixing our eyes on the life to come. I'm not saying that this life doesn't matter. It does. Right? The whole season of kingdom come was on earth as it is in heaven. But we fix our eyes on heaven so we have a better view of the here and now on earth. John said that we should be so deeply concerned about the afterlife because it gives us a clear warning here that this life is not all there is. There's a coming kingdom. There's a future judgment. And Jesus Christ himself is going to serve as that great judge. Look with me at verse 12. His winnowing shovel is in hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with fire that never goes out. John is saying, church, that someday there will be a great separation of people. The people you see bathing in the sun and living their best life, you're like, man, I wish I had that. If they don't know Jesus, the wheat, those who have repented, will get to spend whatever they have with God in heaven. But the sad news is, if you don't repent, much like the chaff here in verse 12, then you'll be burned in hell. Now that might sound old fashioned. That might sound severe. It is. And that's what God is saying here. And what makes hell is so horrible is that the suffering goes on forever. There are people here, maybe some of you here today, when you look at your life, their soul is so horrible. Like from an earthly perspective, outside of God, you've dealt with so many hardships and hard times, right? Life has not been great to you from an earthly perspective. You've dealt with struggles. Split families, financial hardships, right? You're scrapping to get by. Maybe you got beat up when you were younger. Maybe you've been abused, right? That's bad news, but the hope of the gospel, what we can cling to and what we suffer when we go through hardship, is that there's a hope in the kingdom that one day there's no more suffering, there's no more death, there's no more hardship, there's no more pain, and we get to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter the joy of your master, into the kingdom of heaven. It's not because of anything we've done, but everything that Christ did for us. And I want to ask you this morning, my question for you is, are you trusting Jesus as your only hope in heaven? I'm very careful when I use the word hope. Because my hope is built in nothing less. But Jesus, blood Amen. and righteous. Yes. Here's the good news. The good. Here's the good news, church. While we must repent into the kingdom of heaven, we must simultaneously realize that number three, only the perfect life of Jesus makes this repentance possible. You see, we can't repent without Jesus' perfect life. Jesus' obedience makes repentance possible. If you keep reading. In verses 13 to 7, Jesus steps on the scene and he's going to get baptized by John. And John's like, I can't baptize you. You're the coming Messiah. And Jesus said, no, no, no. I need to get baptized. Why? Because I need to fulfill all of righteousness. You see, Jesus was unlike us. He was determined to complete everything that God had set him to do. 
And it was God's will for Jesus to be baptized. And Jesus was always careful to do every single little detail that God asked him to do. You see, repentance is turning away from sin. And it's turning into a renewed relationship with God. But understand that a brand new relationship with God is not possible without the perfect obedience of Jesus. And here's why. Do you know that in order to stand right before God, you have to be perfect? For you to stand perfect before, I'm saying good before God, you have to be perfect. Perfect is the synonym for holy. And why does that matter? It matters because God requires perfection, and based on that, none of us have a chance. But Jesus was the perfectly obedient son on our behalf. He lived the life that we couldn't live. And since God has to punish sin and is just, Jesus went on to take the penalty for sin that we deserve by being perfectly obedient, even death and obedience to be on the cross. Amen. So when we turn from our sins and we trust in God, not only does he cleanse us from our sins, that's only one side of the coin. But the other side is, like I said at the very beginning, we get the righteousness of Jesus. And we can take that to the bank. And it's his righteousness is understood. But we need to understand to be able to have a relationship. And so as we can continue going through this sermon series in the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to close, I want you to know as we move forward in this book, we're going to see three different groups of people. David Platt, a great pastor, he says, I love this, this is what he says. He says, you're going to see three groups of people. You're going to see one, the religious leaders who deny Jesus. You're going to see the crowds of people that follow Jesus. As long as they, Jesus gives them what they want, as long as Jesus meets them on their terms, as long as Jesus meets their interests and scratches their backs, sings the songs that they want to sing, gives them the donuts that they want to hear, preaches for their political affiliations, as long as he does what they want, they're going to say, as soon as they don't, they're going to walk away. That's it. And number three, you're going to see this very small group of disciples. This small group of people who are going to follow Jesus. They're going to learn from him. And guess what's going to happen here? They're going to lose their life for Christ. Amen. And so as we study Matthew, you have to decide what group you're in. Right? You guys, like, <laughs> like the leaders, are you going to completely reject Jesus? Like the crowds, are you going to casually observe Jesus and have your thinking too. This is where many churches tend to say, and even members find themselves adding Jesus to part of your life, doing good things, being active in different ways, but never being 100% committed. Or like the disciples, where you unconditionally follow Jesus. Will you unconditionally follow Jesus? Will you be the few, which I believe we will, I'm prayerful that we will, who repent and say to Jesus and say, you are king. And because you're king, there's no conditions on my obedience to you. I'll follow you wherever you lead me. I will give you whatever you ask of me. I will abandon and repent and turn from all that I have and all that I am because you are king and you are worthy of nothing less than that. This is the heart of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. This is the heart of what it means to be a citizen of heaven. This is the heart of what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God, to be a servant of the king. Repent today. Turn to Jesus today. Confess today. And watch Jesus come into your life and give you the abundant that he wants. Let's pray that. Father in heaven, we love you. And, um, Lord, I'm so thankful for the good news of the gospel. And I'm so thankful for your word <laughs> that we just turn and have to agree. This is what your word says, and we get to say, This is what you say, not what I say. Not what Cody said, not what Will said, not what Oscar says. This is what you say. And what you say, Lord, that we can have the promise, Lord, that your word never returns Lord. That you use it as the very means to accomplish your will, God. That faith comes to be heard 
and hearing comes from your word. And so, Father, I just pray, Lord, if there's anybody that's here today, I don't know, that's been suffering and going through hardships, that's a believer, Lord, and, 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 and maybe has been hiding in their sin or not taking their sin seriously, I, I pray, Lord, that you would, Lord, Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would convict them, that you would help them to acknowledge their sin, that they would confess their sin first and most importantly to you. And Lord, by the confession of their lips, somebody here today needs to hear this. Lord, that's, my brother, you would save somebody here today. For the first time in their life, they might say, Jesus, you are king. I've been down bad entry points. I've chased the South Floridian dream. I've, I've, I've believed the lies, Lord, but I've heard the good news today. And I'm going to, by faith, Lord, I don't know everything, I'm going to give my life to you, God. If, if that's anybody here today, God, I'm going to open my eyes. I'm going to ask everybody else to close, but if that's anybody here today, would you raise their hand? Yes, God. Yes, God. God saved somebody today. And God, for those of us maybe who have been, I don't know, Lord, a prodigal man or woman or a prodigal child who's gone away, who knows you, Lord, but straight away, God, would you pierce their hearts today by helping them to see their sin? But God, as their hearts are pierced, Lord, may they see you clearly and they see them. And may they just run back into the arms of their father. God, do a work that only you can do. We ask this because we believe in you. Father, not in the front, but in the back, Lord, I just pray that you'll be on our deacons, a few of our deacons, and maybe Mark and Renee, Lord, that you'll, 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 I pray that you'll leave into the back here, the back corners of our room. And that, Lord, if there's anybody that needs prayer, if anybody needs to confess, if anybody needs to talk, just have prayer, if anybody needs to respond to Jesus, Lord, you, you are the one with them to go and do business with you. Because we want to be the type of people who confess our sins publicly to one another. And Lord, who, who do our good deeds to you in private, Lord. We love you, Father. Help us to worship, Lord. If this is moving us to worship, it should happen. We say all these things in the name of Jesus. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.